Hello, everyone. I'm that damn pipsqueak, and I'm joined here by Egg and Percy Quirsey. Um, and we're going to go into a deep dive on control. Um, but first, uh, let's make sure to uh, show our various control accolades. Percy, um, you know, talk a little bit about yourself, uh, what your favorite type of control is, and what you've won with a control deck. Uh, I win everything, so that's a mute question, but... I'm Hersey, and I think what's, I don't know if I have a specific kind of control deck beyond, like, very hard control in general, but seeing my three mind types have been, like, super greedy tapo control, very tempo efficient fast control, and then, like, whatever legend weaving is, which I guess is prison control. So as long as I have, like, a bunch of counter spells and interaction and very few win cons, I'm good. <laughs> Legit. Uh, Egg, what about yourself? Yeah, uh, so I, I'm Egg. I won the first Grand Prix that we ever had for MSEM using a deck that had dorky creatures and counter spells. And then I won the most recent Grand Prix with a deck that had dorky creatures and counter spells. So, really, my favorite control is anything where I get to counter every spell that my opponent casts and then put them with dorky creatures. I think Percy and I are on pretty similar pages there. Um, and I'm Pipsqueak. And I've won two GPs, one with uh, Blue Red Phoenixes, which was kind of a control deck where one of the revelations I had about two-thirds of the way through the GP is, oh wait, this deck is way better as a tempo deck than as a control deck, um, which hugely helped. And I've also won a GP with Mono Black Control, aka Villainy, in its uh, first month in the format. Um, since then I have repeatedly got in uh in one of the top spots but failed to actually close anything out um and my favorite type of control is usually the types of control that quickly pivot from stabilizing to winning um and in particular i like decks with either combo finishes or the ability to turn their removal spells into uh reach at a moment's notice um so yeah let's just uh kind of talk around about uh what control is um, so for me, the thing that defines control most is if all of the different archetypes care about different resources, control wants to buy as much time as possible in order to hit the point in the game where all of their card advantage starts coming online, when they're able to cast their, uh, expensive finishers, and once they have the game locked down. So the feeling where you're sitting there, seven cards in hand to your opponents too, and knowing that they're holding just lands to your, uh, suite of counter spells. Yeah. yeah. Think... You go ahead. All right, All right I'll go. Um, I think what defines control to me, at least the control decks that I'm most familiar with, are uh, the uh, ability to always be able to react. Um, most most control archetypes, and you know, there's exceptions to everything, but most control archetypes are built to be able to see what your opponent is doing and respond to it in ways that are more powerful than what they were doing. And then generally you'll go over the top with some sort of win condition that's more powerful than anything that they have. But mostly it's just that that ability to always be able to deal with what your opponent has just done, whether it's with counter spells or removal or whatever it may be. Yeah. One of the things that I think is part of control is and why I like the, the deck style is because I see control as the deck that's most able to always have the out and does so by stopping the opponent more often than closing out the game, which you could argue that combo or mid-range, they're always out, it's just ending the game. But I like control because it's, it, in theory, if it's built well, should always have an out from pretty much every situation. Yeah, and I uh, kind of want to build on that, which is one of the things that's most interesting about MSEM is, despite the fact that we have a very diverse format, until very recently it felt like a pretty small core set of uh, answers could take on the majority of the format favorably. Um, and I think that's starting to change uh, where people are starting to run more and more diverse decks, which suddenly means that you can't just say, all right, four cursory glance, uh, three to four copies of whatever other counterspell I want. I'm covered with the stack. Let's run in like four point and click removal spells. But now there's starting to become more and more types of decks that are very resilient to that. So do you guys have any thoughts and on it that? And it feels it feels like a lot of that change is because 
it's because we actually introduced new cards that had targeted the same things that were good to target before. Yeah. Because like you mentioned uh, Cursory Glance, being able to hit those low CMC cards, and most decks were packed full of CMC 3 or less cards. But now that Pith Wilt is also in the format, also hitting CMC 3 and less usually, now people are playing the higher cost cards. So by making it easier to hit the meta, like all, the meta's changed to adapt to it. So now control has to go wider with yeah. the answers. And I think it's interesting because if you go back further um, into some of the kind of earlier days of the format, like uh, pre Villain the Musical being added to the format, it was actually really hard to play control back then. Um, because the meta was so diverse, you didn't know what uh, nonsense combo pile uh, JN or CF Keysock was bringing that given month. You had a bunch of people jamming mid-range decks that weren't favorable into the meta, but they were still jamming them. So if you played efficient interaction, you died to the mid-range decks. And if you played, uh, you know, greedy interaction, you died to the combo decks. So it was really in a weird spot where you couldn't actually have all your bases covered. Um, and then the meta kind of shifted such that there was still a bunch of diversity, but it was more possible to kind of cast a net that hit everything. Um, and it'll be interesting to see how things change as we shift back away from that. Yeah, I like I like yeah. Earthy's point that we pushed out a lot of the things that the original suite of good interaction was preying on already with more interaction that preys on it. And we also, you know, with Worlds Away, added the Scions. And the Scions by themselves, I think, shake up how you have to build your control deck because if you have a bunch of cursory glances and a bunch of pith welds and then someone plays with Scion, you just lose. The game is so weird. Yeah. Um, so I think we should kind of just transition to talk about the key cards in MSEM for playing control, both what you're playing against and what you're playing as. So I think to me the most important thing when building any given control is figuring out what is my draw engine or what is, you know, Either what is my draw engine or what is my win con, and the very best decks you pick both those at the same time, like villainy. Um, but you know, what what are some of the ideal draw engines in this format right now, or what ones have you guys experimented with that you really enjoyed? Well, Disco is briefly king, but we're nerfing that. Um, Planet Far Far Away is another new one that's been doing pretty well. It's been able to keep up a very steady drip of cards. Then when it comes to late game card advantage in my decks that actually run it because Jeskai doesn't run much late game card advantage I've been, I have been really enjoying a uh, thing I forget what it's called against the, not against the waves <laughs> the enchantment edge of water I've been really mm. enjoying edge of water even though it's not actually card advantage but it's got really good card selection hmm yeah, um, I think, well, obviously I'm a big fan of Endless Disco, and I still will be with the changes. I think it's still going to be a powerful engine. Um, my my new sleeper card, uh, I've talked about it a bit, is Key of Augury, which I've put into decks and have played in non-competitive uh, tournaments or settings and have enjoyed um it, it functions a lot like the old Endless Discovery, where it's one mana card that you can pay one about three times to draw a card. Uh, you don't get to see what you're getting. You have to jump through a hoop kind of to get there. But since it can exile from your graveyard, you've got fetch lands. Most uh, decks, most control decks are running a varied selection of creatures and sorceries and instants. You should be able to get about three cards worth of value out of your key before you have to uh, move on to your next key and I think that you know the the rate of paying one blue mana four times across a bunch of turns to draw three cards is is one that I, I'm willing to do in pretty much any setting so that's the one that I'm high on right now um, for me as a control player I tend to favor burst draw a lot more over trickle draw so a lot of my success uh, has come from the uh, dream site well draw engine and just playing a deck that abuses the fact that it can reliably find Dream Sight well, cast Dream Sight well, recast from the graveyard, find another copy, and just draw five cards repeatedly. Um, but I also had a lot of fun with pre-nerf uh, Worlds Away um, when that was three mana instant speed, draw three cards. Um, and I think That's even, basically burst. Yeah, I think even post-nerf uh, three mana sorcery speed, draw three cards still has a lot of, uh, a lot of potential. Um, and in terms of a uh, kind of 
key engine for control decks that I think is really underplayed. Um, I think uh, Gorbez Index, after it got its rework, is actually now very good in control. Um, but I think you just need to build your deck to have a kind of uh, curve to its interaction suite. Um, but beyond just the draw engines, obviously, if you're control deck, you also need to know what your interaction suite looks like, um, what finishers you have access to, and also what are the key cards you must be able to answer in order to be competitive. Um, so yeah, uh, Hersey, can you tell us a little bit, like when you're building a control deck, um, what, what is your process like? What are the specific things that you're trying to cover bases with? Uh, a lot of time I aim for seven to eight counter spells in the main board, four of which will always be curse against. Like even as the meta moves more towards higher CMC cards, decks will still be running lower CMC cards to get to that point. So Curse of Glance will pretty much never be like fully dead. The secondary counter spell, I'm actually not sure I'm going to be ending up with that a lot of the time now, because I used to use Arc Gen, but so many decks are running uh, very powerful late game utility lands that Arc Gen is much more questionable than it used to be. I can still justify it sometimes if I have like an Intrepid Mirrorgate package, but I don't. It's not. It's often not worth the risk. And after I have my seven to eight counter spells, I go for usually I, I tend to avoid a lot of the time the one mana removal because it's a bit too narrow for me. I much I'm always fine running the two to three mana removal that would hit pretty much any creature. So it's counter spells, then creature removal, and then maybe a handful of all target removal just in case. Yeah, I'm a. Uh... I'm big on counter spells, um, and Cursory Glance was my pet card for a long time. Basically, anytime I started building a deck, it was four times Cursory Glance. The way that the meta is shifting and the threats that people are playing to win the game, I'm not convinced that Cursory Glance is where I want to be anymore. Because if someone, you know, just spends five mana on a sand again, I feel really bad and then probably lose that game. Or if they spend six mana on Iviana or whatever more than three mana card people are going to win the game with because not just Intrepid and Villainy anymore. Uh, <laughs> so, so I'm a big fan of spells that just say counter target spell. And I think our best one in this format is Unraveling. Unraveling is a card that obviously gets better when you put more into your deck and obviously gets better as the game goes along. Because when you turn it in to counter target spell, scry two, draw a card, or counter target spell, lock your lands, scry two, draw a card, it's just the value goes through the roof on that card. Um, and so in any control deck where I'm trying to go long, unraveling is probably where I'm starting now. Four of those, and then whatever suite of counter spells I think is going to best address the meta, whether it's cursory glance or destructive ambition or negate or what have you. Uh, as for actual removal, it's hard to say no to Pith Wilt right now, just because it, especially in a deck that's running counter spells, can hit four CMC and lower, which is a big game. Um, and I've also been a fan of the one mana instant speed interaction options that we have, just to make sure that you don't get run over. Uh, because I think the biggest way that control loses right now is if someone's faster than you, and luckily no one's trying to be, but if, you know, you're facing five points of damage on board on turn two, it's easy to lose that game before you can get your feet under you. So I like Exeunt, I like um, Frailty, I like Twilight Ambush, basically anything that costs one mana and removes any small creature from the board. Those are what I'm looking at right now when I'm starting a control deck. Something that will win the game when I'm going long and something that will win the game if they're trying to go fast. Yeah, I usually have the um, opposite approach in my control decks where the first thing I do when I build a control deck is decide I'm not going to lose to decks that go under me. I'm not going to lose to aggro. So I usually, it, previously, I always started with 4x Memento Mori, or sorry, 4x Exeunt, and then 2 to 3x whatever my two mana interaction suite was. What, you know, long ago that was Memento Mori. Now it's Pith Wilt. Uh, Pith Wilt goes up to 4x because that card is really good. Um, and now I don't actually always do 4x Exeunt. Sometimes it's a, uh, three and two split with Exeunt and Descend Upon the Helpless, since I don't want to run too much one mana removal, but Descend is basically sorcery speed Exeunt, but it has an incredibly powerful flashback mode. 
Um, and then once I once I've solidified the fact that I am yes in black and controlling, I usually <laughs> fill out my white uh, my white suite. So either that'll be vibrant rapture or singularity's grasp or violent collapse or something along those lines. Um, usually uh, these days it is just always vibrant rapture since I've been really building a lot of kind of greedy over the top decks that can abuse the extra petals it generates. Um, but after that is when I start to look into counter magic. These days I'm kind of lower on counter magic in the context of the for- format. I think I've had a lot of matches recently where counter magic has just been annoying to sequence or has felt like it's missed key cards or so on. So uh, with this GP, I took a different approach and said, I'm not running any counter magic. I'm running more uh, general purpose uh, single target removal and I'm running hand attack. Um, I don't think I'd call this experiment a success, but it was definitely attempting to apply a theory that I had. Uh, It's definitely something I think can work. Like, charge control isn't good at the moment, but back when I was running it, it only ran like three counter spells total. And just the ability to have a bunch of uh, uh, highly efficient, even sorcery speed removal still carried it through. As long as your removal and your card draw can line up well enough with the meta, you don't need the counter magic. One other thing that I think is really important in this format is you... I think it is actually very difficult to get away with the win con of eventually. Um, and I know, Hersey, you have a very different approach. <laughs> um, but I've just had so many games where if I don't have a fast enough win con, I'll, you know, I'll lock my opponent out, and then we're just sitting there drawing cards, and they'll lava spike me. And I'll be like, oh, well, I had X unit in hand, but no counter magic, so I'm dead. Um, and so I really take the approach of play powerful finishers that once you're ready to close the door, they close the door really fast or they gain you a bunch of life incidentally. So even if they don't uh, close the door really fast, like Lucian, um, you gain enough life in the process that it's okay. Um, so for that end, I had a lot of success with Iviana as a troll finisher. Um, I had a lot of success with uh, Children of the Clouds because that card's actually insane. Um, and I've had a lot of success with Recall Forgotten Aeons or similar Revelation-based win cons. Yeah, one thing that I want uh, to mention before we stop talking about key cards that I just want to get out there, and this is something that I don't have the right answer for yet, uh, and I think is going to require some you know, deck-building decisions and choices down the road for us control players that are going to be kind of difficult, is... I have lost probably about half of the games that I lost playing control are because my opponent had utility lands that I couldn't interact with. And Hersey brought those up uh, a little bit ago, but we have, you know, Naraba, which draws cards. We have Monument of Queens, which ends the game and can't die to Pith Wild and can't be counterspelled. Um, there's, uh, there's Band a Monument. There. Yeah, that one. Um, Heart of Zadina generates, you know, 100,000 mana and makes it kind of hard to interact uh, with giant spells. There's there's so many good lands that are, you know, it's, it's rare for control to pack land destruction. Uh, but you need to have a plan to not lose to these kinds of cards. So whether your plan is just to go over the top of Naraba or to finish the game before they can use that as a legitimate engine, or if you have cards that just say destroy target creature so that you can kill the monument or, you know, any other man land, you, you probably need to have at least some sort of plan, even if it's just out of the sideboard, to deal with these cards. Because not, not just control deck, but mid-range and tempo, everyone's packing these uh, value lands these days. And I think that they're net very good for the format to have these kinds of uh, lands because... Good lands mean that people will put lands in their deck, and that's a stupid thing to say, but when people don't have to put <laughs> in their deck, they'll just end up getting mana screwed because they think that they need to cut down on lands so they don't flood. Yep. And the more good lands we have, the more lands people put in their deck, but it does mean that you have to have a plan for them when playing control, and I don't know what that plan is right now. Yeah, I've been... So one of the things I really liked about playing Abzan Control is access to three copies of Demon Worthy main deck and the fourth copy on the sideboard. 
because nothing feels quite as good as being able to say, okay, cool. So uh, I can't, I can't deal with that land. So I'm just going to exile it. Um, and the occasional moments where you cheese someone out by saying, oh, huh, they just missed a land drop. And then zoop one of their uh, non-utility lands that they were hoping to tap for mana is also uh, really fun to have access to that free win type of thing. Um, and Hersey, you recently found some pretty deep tech to deal with those things in uh, Legend Weaving, right? Uh, yeah, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I've been playing, I've been starting to pack Isolated in some of my decks as a way to deal with these utility lands, which is a two cost blue aura, enchants any permanent, and that permanent loses all abilities except for mana abilities, and also loses its name, but that almost never matters. It's come up so, once where I've seen someone play a second copy of a legendary thing, but since the first one was didn't have any abilities, it wasn't actually super relevant. But it was yeah, just that, kind of funny. So that's part of... I have isolated in Jeskai, but it's still part of the reason I'm switching from Jeskai to Weaving over the next little while. It's because Weaving just has far more ways to answer these utility lands. It can fetch up the isolated mm -hmm. to take out lands it has an intrepid package so i can run mirror gate if i want it and the ability to loop serene prayer will hit monument of queens it's just just as well as any creature based win con so because a lot of jess guys losses have been to like okay i've stabilized but they have from the reba and seven man lands so i just can't keep up in cards anymore yeah um as someone who has been, some of the other things about Abzan is I get to be the bad guy and do that exact thing to people because it runs an intrepid package and you're this big man of Heart of Zadina deck. And the feeling of getting to activate Heart of Zadina in order to pay for your Nareva and still hold up mana to interact is just so filthy. Um, it, when, <laughs> when I'm doing it, I'm just like, wow, this is, uh, no, no one can beat this late game. You, you simply can't. Um, but I also think one of my big beliefs of playing control in this format and every other one is there is always a bigger fish. No matter how greedy that you think you've got and no matter how unbeatable you think you are in the late game, there is always someone who has registered a deck that cannot for the life of itself beat someone who goes turn one, here's my 2-1. Two, two it's like, oh, well, I'm dead to that. But they've just packed a little bit more greed than you. Or they've packed just a little bit better of a late game engine than you. And... I think that's one of the reasons I favor actually ended the game so highly is because as, as much as it feels like, ah, yes, I'm invincible because I got to the late game, I don't actually think any deck can really be invincible in the late game because there is always someone who looked at your deck and decided to cut one of the pieces of interaction in favor of more card draw. Yeah, like bef before these lands, one of the things I liked about the Jeskai control list was just because all this interaction was so cheap, it could just flat out stop any of that card vantage stuff from ever happening, but you can't counterspell a land. So now that one of those main strengths of Jeskai where it could just stop late games from happening by sheer force of will just doesn't, doesn't apply anymore. Yeah. Um, I think we can move on to talk about uh, some of the cards that you have to be on your radar when you're playing control in order to not die to them out of nowhere. Um, so, uh, do either of you guys have kind of a mental checklist that you go through when you're building control decks of, oh, got to make sure I have that base covered? Uh, yeah. yes, kind of. Yeah, I have I the think. general, th okay, I have the general thing of, like, just small aggro creatures. That's less specific cards, that's more than general thing. In terms of specific cards, the ones I look out for are Villainy and Lear and Alpha. Those are the two things where if they resolve, it's very hard to come back from, I've found. Yeah, but, I think yeah, what, I mostly, what I mostly try to prepare for is to make sure that I don't lose the game to a resolved Planeswalker. Uh, I think that we have a really big handful of Planeswalkers in format right now between... Uh, Lucian and Xanagan and Iviana and even at smaller uh, mana cost Savid and Mabel that if they sit unchecked for you know two or three turns the game will probably just end because they'll win it. Um, so I, I, I pack counter spells that can catch the early ones and hit the late ones. Um, I, I messed up in my last deck and actually didn't bring 
counter spells beyond unraveling, they could hit Ibiana, and I think lost a game to it. Uh, so <laughs> that's a good lesson for me that someone's always going to try to win the game with a planeswalker, and you need to have an answer for that. Um, I, I agree that Layer and Alpha is probably the big creature because even if you remove the wolf itself, you're still facing six power. Um, so that's a big thing to just make sure you can deal with the whole board. But for me, I always start by making sure that I can win against greedy mid-range planeswalkers because I've found that people love doing that. Yeah, as I've mentioned before, the first thing I always do is make sure I have answers to someone's turn one or turn two play. Um, since when I was first trying to play control in this format, I got my ass handed to me a lot by someone going like, turn one mana aesthetic, turn two here's my three-drop combo piece that puts you at interact or you're dead. And I would look and say, oh, I think I have to choose I'm dead. Um, so I pretty much decided I never want to lose a game because my opponent had to play turn one or two, and I just did not have a contingency plan for that. Um, and then once, once I have that in mind, I usually try to build main decks that can beat Villainy, um, since Villainy... Even if I feel like a lot of control decks are actually fairly favored against Villainy, um, I really... Villainy is a card that sees so much play that I think it is nonsensical to just disregard it. Um, And then recently, the other thing I've been keeping in mind is, what is my plan if my opponent plays uh, a Scion? Um, Do I have an answer to a 5-drop creature that makes immediate ETB value? What's, what's What's the plan there? Yeah, and one thing that I will mention is that, especially from the point of view of someone who wants to bring counter spells, or if you're doing the other style of control Abzan right now, you're bringing Team Unworthy, right? Anything that deals with these Planeswalkers also hits them. So yeah. it's very rare that you're going to bring something that says destroy target creature or Planeswalker in this format. Hero's Downfall is just not really an effective value. So the... The consideration for villainy and planeswalkers really overlap, and that they're a consideration for hard to, well, well long game winning, uh, non value engines. Value engines. Yeah. Uh, there was that little bit where I was playing, playing. I think I was up to three copies at one point of Once Abandoned in the main deck of Dream Sight Well, and that felt so correct. Um, Hersey, didn't you play Reconstruct in your uh, um, chart control? Or was was that uh, yeah. deck, or was that sideboard? Chart control ran Reconstruct, but the, a large reason why it ran that over Once Abandoned was because that was back when Tron was a huge thing. Mm. Though as lands are becoming popular again, it might be the right choice once more. Yeah. No, I think, I think Reconstruct has a lot of uh, potential in this format. The one thing that feels really awkward about it versus Once Abandoned is the fact that Reconstruct doesn't tag um intrepid Mm, yeah but all right so let's move on to if we haven't convinced you already um that control is super fun and powerful uh let's talk about why people should play control when is it good who might enjoy it yeah i'll start this one um i think you play control if and this is going to sound glib but you play control if you want to be in control of the game uh for me it's really that simple (laughs) Um, if you want to feel like you are driving the game, then build a control deck. Uh, I always fear when I'm playing aggro decks or anything where I'm being proactive that my opponent's just going to answer what I do and then I'm going to have nothing left to do. I want to be the one with the answers. Um, and I, I think that if you are someone who wants to be able to answer what your opponent is doing, obviously control is perfect. But even if you're just someone who wants to not have to make the first move. Play control. Um, control is good, in my opinion, when formats are slower and when people are playing synergy or not particularly greedy mid range decks. Uh, control beats up on synergy decks because all you have to do is answer the, you know, A plus B. If you just answer one half of it, then the other half doesn't usually do anything unless they're particularly powerful on their own, in which case it's probably not just a synergy deck. Um, And I found that most control decks do pretty well against mid-range 
because mid range is trying to do one dumb thing a turn and control is usually holding up one answer a turn or is prepared to answer that one dumb thing each turn. Uh, so right now I think control is particularly good because a lot of people are on villainy. A lot of people are playing scions. A lot of people are putting intrepid in their decks. And those are things where when your opponent spends three mana to play intrepid or to play villainy and you're holding up a counter spell for it or you have the demon worthy or the pith well it feels really good because your opponent's getting you know, a little bit of value or none at all and then get the answer really efficiently and then move on to your turn draw more cards uh so i think right now control is very good in the format that we're playing um and formats like this are where control thrives I touched on this earlier, but the reason I think the the reason I say control is because I like knowing that there's always there's in theory always going to be a line that can win a game. Like sometimes the game will get out of hand, and you know that like, that game in particular is lost, but that every matchup has some way to get through it as long as your draws aren't t- too garbage. I like always knowing that I could turn this around, or there's no unwinnable matchups stuff like that. While well, a lot of other types of decks you get to the point where you, you just look at your combo opponent going off or the other control deck locking down, like, you'd know like there's no way you're getting out of this unless they top deck like a ton of lands in a row. Like the game, like the matchup's lost, the game is lost and you don't have a way to control. Oh God. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Lola, Lola. Why doesn't this software have a... Oh, the dogs are offended mid-range players. <laughs> um, and as to like win control is good. I feel like MSM actually has enough of the low-cost tools that arguably control is all, there's always going to, I think there will always be a good control deck for pretty much any meta that shapes up an MSCM. Because I think we have the range of tools that you can always if the meta gets fast, you can build a fast control deck. If the meta gets slow, you can build a prison or a late game control deck. Like, I think there's always the tools there to make the control deck that will work. Yeah, so so Egg's answer was glib, but mine is arrogant. Um, I think <laughs> people generally will enjoy control if they are someone who likes being able to leverage their skill to win games of Magic. Um, oh, and I yeah. don't mean that like in terms of, oh, control is the most big brain deck, but in Magic, one of the things that, one of the main differences between better players and worse players is how many mistakes you make in a match. And it's not even about, oh, you made a more correct choice. It's, oh, you didn't screw up this little thing. And that means that the longer a game goes, the more likely it is going to be to favor the better player because you're, you're reducing the variance in that game. You're giving more time for more draws and you're giving your opponent more time to screw something up. So one of the things I definitely like about Control Deck is the fact that I can kind of drag the game into a long, prolonged slugfest and feel confident that as long as I make more correct choices than my opponent and there's not, you know, some astronomical intervention of luck, I can feel like I will probably win that game. Um, When is Control good? I think Control is... So I'm actually going to take the opposite approach. I think most Control Decks actually struggle versus well-built and well-piloted mid-range decks. Um, I think synergy-based decks, which usually get lumped into mid-range because that's the only type of strategy that mid-range, uh, that synergy decks can really succeed at, other than sometimes aggro. Uh, synergy decks where if you take away one piece, the whole thing falls apart, those decks really struggle against control. But the like tried-and-true mid-range deck of, I'm going to hit you with hand attack and then run out a bunch of two-for-one creatures and, uh, you know, Colicon command back my Snapcaster Mage, that type of stuff. Control deck Wrong is- format. Well, I'm sure there's equivalents here. I don't play mid-range decks that don't have a ridiculous ramp plan, though, so I wouldn't know. Um, But, uh, okay, I guess the equivalent here is, um, you know, when you sneak past a uh, Ancestral Council, past their counter magic, which finds an Anurin Encounters, which you can then cast to uncounterably draw three cards, (coughs) or which potentially draws you into a Scion, which can recur the Ancestral Council they killed or countered on turn two, and then you just, like, snowball from there. Um, those types of or- matchups are very difficult to play against unless your interaction just happens to line up correctly. And if your opponent is doing things to play around your interaction, they can kind of get out of control. But if your opponents are on 
hyperlinear decks or decks where if you remove one piece from the Jenga tower, they can't win the game. Uh, control eats those decks uh, up. It feels amazing to play control into those meta games. Um, and I think the other time when control is good is when uh, ramp and go over the top decks are bad. So when you when you when you know that eventually you'll run your opponent out of seven mana haymakers, control feels great. When it feels like every single turn you're going to have an answer or die spell, control feels really rough and you start thinking about, why didn't I just kill them on turn four? They were doing nothing for the first four turns. Why didn't I take advantage of that time? Yeah, I think that's fair. Um, the greedier a mid-range deck gets, the harder it is to control a beat. Um, I, I find a lot of times, specifically the mid-range decks that I've had trouble beating are the ones that have that can get value from the grave without needing to cast spells first. Like, the stuff that, re that recurs itself from the grave, that I've always found very difficult to deal with because it's hard to interact with because it's usually activated abilities. And so you need the grave re exile, but most grave exile doesn't work as highly efficient counter spells or removal too, so you have to make that choice to get weaker against a bunch of other stuff in order to target the recursion mid-range decks. Yeah, um, I really agree with that. And I also think that, obviously, all of this... Control runs a huge spectrum, so there's types of control yeah. which can play a more aggressive game plan. I would say one of the reasons that Esper Flash uh, X deck was really successful was because it did have those draws where it was like, all right, well, uh, turn four, I'm going to play this Aegis um, after I played Apanya on turn three, and I'm just going to try to kill you in the next two turns, which I'm going to take right after the other. <laughs> yeah. Um, but on the other hand, you have some decks which, uh, like, the fastest they can win is, well, on turn six, I'll play an Iviana, and I'll kill them by turn nine, I guess. And that's that's not super where you want to be when people are going over the top of efficient interaction. Um, but it is where you want to be if people are uh, kind of running slightly more uh, efficient decks um, where you can more easily one-for-one -one them. Killing with Aviana is still too fast. You gotta go for the almost entirely reliant on decking yourself with the Aiken. Yeah. It's the only way to play. <laughs> the I, only winning strategy. I think <laughs> I did way better with blue white. Uh I think my two my win cons were four copies of Aiken, two copies of Saya, and then sealing my opponent's win cons, and one copy of Seto San. Um <laughs> I think that deck got, like, third, and it really shouldn't have, because that was back when Seek Prophecy milled you, and I remember one time I, you know, cast Seek Prophecy, and I saw Aiken, Saya, Setosan, and I was like, oh, this is half my win cons, <laughs> and I'm losing two of them by resolving this spell, <laughs> which is not a fun feeling, I'll tell you that much. Clearly, we buffed Seek Prophecy by making it tuck to bottom. Yeah, just uh, heard a couple of other incidental decks, but definitely buffed control. Um, okay, so we're going to wrap this up with a particularly uh, hot-button issue. Um, so in the recent survey that went out to the players in the format, uh, one of the questions that we asked was, what is the best archetype in MSEM? And the answer was overwhelmingly, I think it was like over 60% of the player base uh, might have been higher. Um, said control was the best archetype in MSEM. Um, I would ask what each of us thinks on that, but also each of us answered control for the best archetype in MSEM. So <laughs> I'm just going to get that spoiler out of here. Um, which is, yeah, like I, think, yeah. like I think there are definitely decks I can beat up on the control decks. Like I think if Augur brought that two toughness aggro deck back again, that would crush a lot of our control decks. But overall... I think control is definitely favored in the current meta. Yeah. yeah even specifically what it is, is control is good against a lot of the types of decks that people in our format like playing. Exactly. Um, yes. I, I think if you were to abstract away a lot of player preference and just look at what are the most powerful decks in the format, control really struggles to beat burn, for instance, um, which is really good in our format. It's just hideously underplayed. Control really struggles to beat the kind of mono green turbo ramp decks that exist and have the tools to be successful. Um, but just people don't really play that deck. Uh, if, if you're a control deck on the draw 
and your opponent plays a turn two Sabne, there's not a lot of options you have in that circumstance. Um, yeah, like I think, I think a uh, a big part of why control is being seen as good now is because this is the first time we've had like for a long time. This is the first time we've had enough players where we have like an actual chunk of control players. Because for the longest time, it was windy for a few months, and then it was like me and Cyber on and off each, so it you could have like whole GPs with neither of us on control. And then you start picking up, but you were still also on and off. It's like, it's only recently we've had multiple dedicated control players from month to month. So I think it's, there's a chance that control has always been this good. It's just that we didn't have enough people playing it. Yeah, and it's kind of interesting given how many cards we buffed for the sake of control decks. Because we were like, why, why does no one play control? This format doesn't have enough control. And, you know, we added almost strictly better factor fiction to the format, and suddenly no one was playing control still. Um, <laughs> which is a buff we reverted because we realized, you know, wait, we now actually have control players. We don't need to have this ridiculous card. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it turns out people just didn't want to play control. Um, but yeah, I, I agree that a lot of the reason control feels like the best deck is because control is the best answer to the decks that are most popular. Uh, I think control is always going to have a good matchup against just a typical villainy pile and everyone loves villainy um control has really good matchups against the untuned theoretical decks that a lot of people like to bring where they say this is a great idea i have 40 great cards for this deck and i'm going to put 20 more in so that i can register it for a tournament and when your deck is not tuned you will probably lose to a even moderately tuned control deck uh but i do think that in a vacuum it's a lot less clear what the best deck is because, you know, if you look at a deck, like, uh, there are a good handful of decks in GPK right now that are just really hard for control to be prepared for all of them. Like, specifically Dodger's Multicolor Parrot Fools deck. You know, if you don't have the pit wilt for the Parrot Fools and then he makes four tokens and gets a a Phoenix back on turn three, maybe you can untap and answer one half of it, but either you're dead to the board or he'll just do it again. Like, And then if you are really focused on being able to kill that and someone just comes in with a four-drop creature like a lodestone goal and then he's like, well, I guess I can't answer that. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff happening that I think makes control worse just because it's hard to be prepared for all of it. And that's more of the format where... Uh, you know, where I'd like to be, where control is not clearly the best, but still has some legs against some of the good strategies. I also suspect the fact that people change decks so often hurts a little bit, because control, more than any other archetype, is one of those things that when you play against it, the more you play against it, the more clear it becomes, oh, these are my important cards in this matchup, and these are the types of hands I need to keep, and those are the cards I need to disrupt from them. Um... Whereas, like, you know, you can usually intuit within the first match you're playing against aggro, oh, this is how I have to play against aggro. But if you're playing a linear deck or, you know, a mid-range pile, it takes some number of reps against a fair variety of control decks before you start to figure out what cards you need to bait with, for instance. Um, and that was one of those things that I thought I was uh, starting to be able to do on... Um, on pod light but then i ran up against uh esper flash and i realized oh none of those heuristics work when my opponent can actually kill me um so i think that deck would need more tuning to be able to beat the esper flash deck just because i need to figure out what important cards are uh which of my cards are most important in that matchup how to defend those how to you know react appropriately etc i remember the experiencing the flip side of that it doesn't happen as much anymore but back when jn played a lot there's a similar thing of like when you're familiar with the matchup it gets a lot easier from the control side because jn every month it seemed would bring a different highly resilient linear combo deck <laughs> and and every single one had a different random piece you had to interact with that wasn't immediately obvious yes. It was horrifying to try and play against, and it changed so often it was impossible to keep up with. 
Yeah, because sometimes feel... he just cast pocket aces. He'd be like, okay, resolved. And then the game would be over. He'd be like, wait, what? How did I lose? I didn't even do anything. I think this is clearly erasure for the couple of months where Jan brought highly resilient linear tempo decks that would <laughs> turn one on Grove Champion, turn two Storm Surge, and then be able to uh, remove your turn one play and then hit you for like you know, <laughs> seven. <laughs> and you're like, oh, okay, this is this is how this game is going. Okay, I'm dead. Uh, but that that's the thing, right? Is even their control decks, and it's not always immediately obvious, control decks are always making concessions in deck building. Um, yeah. If, yeah. If, you're prior, if you're like me and you're prioritizing your turn one interaction, you're making some sacrifices for your ability to answer like go wide boards or if not go wide boards certainly uh mana dork into five drop um yeah that's kind of access like yeah sorry you finish that's kind of access like you do the you always get the turn one interaction i find i almost never do turn one interaction because i'm fine letting those one or even two drops hit me for a few turns while i set up for everything else yeah it's very you have to choose what you're going to be good against and what you're going to allow to be a risk um and I, I think I'd, it'd be interesting to see, like, you know, if we had more uh, ramp decks or more mid-range decks, I imagine uh, Pipsqueak-style control would be a lot worse. But also if we had um, a whole bunch of burn decks, uh, Hersey-style control uh, faces up very poorly <laughs> against Lava Spikes. Well, until you land the Serene Prayer. But that's beside the point. Well, I mean... Yeah. Yeah, for the if the for the deck I'm switching to yet, Jeskai was specifically built to be good against those kind of fast burn or aggro decks. Interesting. I can tell you that egg style flash definitely loses the burn. Uh, <laughs> because it's the, the deck that my partner likes to play the most. And when I tested Esper Flash against the burn deck, it tended to go they just go one drop, two drop, three drop, and I'd be at three health before I was able to stabilize against it. And when you're at three health against a burn deck, you lose. You're sweating yeah, bullets but... every single draw step. It's so bad. <laughs> Generally, the game just ends because, you know, they orchestrate a storm surge. Like, oh no, all I have is unraveling. <laughs> and then you lose uh-huh. the game. Uh, so control, not so great against burn when I build it. But it is good against villainy, uh, which most people like to play. You know, figure wins. So, related to that, there's kind of this big question of how do you counter control? Um, and other than the obvious answer of, like, it depends, because we've just <laughs> elaborated that there's so many different types of control decks out there. Let's talk about some different strategies that may or may not work depending on the control deck. Sure. Um, I think there are two really clean ways to beat control. One of them is to be very fast. Um, control decks usually will be able in the early times to answer one thing at a time. Uh, so if you're a deck that has two good aggro creatures right out of the gate, or you know three good aggro creatures and then some backup spells by turn three, it's hard for control to catch back up, and by the time they're able to remove what's on the board, you'll probably have them in burn range. So if you're going really fast, uh, which generally requires red, but I guess you can probably technically do it with white in some formats, probably not this one, um, that, that's a good way to be control, because you can just get under them before they get their, their winning position. Uh, another way is one that, Piper, you mentioned earlier, which is just go really greedy uh, and... If you are a greedy mid-range deck where all of your plays kind of get you 1.75 cards worth of value or, you know, two cards worth or it's a card net neutral or whatever, if, if you never do anything that they can just answer one for one, then you'll probably end up keeping ahead, especially if you're packing a couple of cards that can't be countered just to kind of get them every now and then, like in Nuren Encounters. Um that's another way to beat control because when control tries to answer things one for one and fails because you've gotten uh, half a card's worth of value out of six cards, which gives you three up on control, it's really hard for them to win those games. And then also the thing I touched on before where if you're a 
so usually mid range, but other decks can do this too. We have a bunch of stuff that can get value straight from being in the grave. That can be hard for control to deal with because you need to specifically tech for that. Like if you don't have, if you're not packing dedicated grave hate, a departed evangel is going to be really rough for you. Because chances are you're only, you're only going to have one or two creatures on the board as your win conditions. And if you have to hold those back to block the departed evangel every single turn, you're not winning the game kind of deal. Yeah, phoenixes can do a similar thing where you can yeah. counter the spells that they cast to get back to phoenix and then you get hit for six. Yeah, um, also on that front, a strategy that is tried and true in many other formats but hasn't seen as much play here, um, especially as uh, the ninjas deck got refined over and over again. If you hit control with somewhere on the order of two to three draw spells in the first two turns of the game, it's really hard for them to actually stop you in any meaningful fashion. One, because you see their hand and you just know, oh, that's what I need to play around. Um, but also because usually they're going to have, you know, a couple pieces of interaction and then some hand sculpting. And if you either deny the, uh, the interaction and they're forced to burn the hand sculpting early to try to figure out, okay, how am I going to get into this game? Um, or you take, you know, one piece of interaction, uh, leave another piece of interaction you can play around and take the hand sculpting, they're now just at the mercy of their top decks. Um, so uh, back when uh, Greg uh, Scavenger, I think that's what it was called, uh, yeah. was able to mind twist your opponent, it felt kind of impossible to play control, um, especially counter magic based control. Uh, Monument of the Fallen Man also adds to that. Um, if your opponent goes turn uh, to Monument and your control deck on the draw, you can't counter that. And now, they're going to be, they've effectively blanked all of your counter magic that you would have wanted to aim at creatures. Now, monument decks so, frequently end up running a bunch of uh, non-creature spells, so you can at least tag those, but it gets kind of nasty pretty quickly. So basically what we're getting at here, or at least what you're getting at here, is to counter control, you play fifth decks and then tune them a bit more, I don't know. Because <laughs> um, th these are these are all cards that Fifth loves to play. He loves packing like the seven to eight discard spells in a monument deck, and then just going to town. I mean, there's a reason why those decks are always kind of a nightmare match uh, matchup for the types of control decks I build. Um, and yeah. the main reason I win them is by virtue of being lucky, or by missing them in the uh, Swiss rounds. Um, like uh, the GPI won when I was on Villainy. Um, I had one of the luckiest series of my life, um, and I still almost lost to that deck. The only reason I didn't lose was because of a really tight series of drawing repeated flesh to rots. Like, I think I had <laughs> runner, runner, flesh to rot, which was the only way I had of not just dying to Granny, uh, you know, Suzume, uh, looping just these two drops that made you discard a card. And I was like, okay, well, I can just barely, you know, especially because Villainy doesn't actually deal with Suzume that well. Because anytime you try to burn one of the creatures, it just bounces back up and you don't gain any life. Yeah. Anytime you try to kill one of the creatures to draw cards, they bounce back up, you don't gain any life. And you are kind of nickel and diming it uh, down, but it, it's just a really difficult experience. Uh, and I think subconsciously, my realization of, man, that deck couldn't beat a Scorch if its life depended on it. Definitely informed my next control deck, which was Ninhasir Control. Um, which was partially developed as a response of, okay, I'm tired of dying to ninjas. This is how I'm going to beat ninjas. And even then, I still had a difficult ninjas matchup, because if you hit uh, Ninhasir with a bunch of discard spells, it has no ca uh, card advantage. It just has to burn your creatures and hope to top deck better than you are. I do appreciate that throughout this podcast... It, this control podcast, we keep referring to like teching against villainy and stuff, whatever. When like half of villainy decks are also control decks. <laughs> that's well, that's the thing is I and I I went into this a little bit in another podcast episode with Caillou. Um, the original villainy decks were control decks, and then they kind of got replaced by uh, tempo villainy and mid range villainy. And I feel like we're starting to see a return to true control villainy with these four-color, five-color greed piles. Um, yeah. But I also kind of think they're worse than just being on mid-range villainy. So, you know, Also, the, awesome. the, the very sentence of five-color villainy is absurd, and I love it. 
Yeah, if you told me that that was possible a year ago, I probably would have said, man, we fucked up a lot, didn't we? Um, And I don't think we did exactly, but also all of the cards that that deck is playing that make it want to play more than just mono black are all from the last set edition. Like, no rest, and Whisperwood's Exploration, and Pith Wilt, and Dead Man's Party, and uh, Destructive Ambition. It's like, oh, huh. (laughs) That's all from three sets. Interesting. Got there. Um, all right, so I think uh, we can start wrapping things up here. Um, do any of you guys have like kind of last words you want to get in on this subject? Uh, I don't know how tight you want to keep the time here on Stone the Attorney, but do we want to talk about like a brief overview of the various control decks we play and their strengths and weaknesses, or is that just going too specific, too broad kind of deal? Some of it's specific oh. and broad at the same time. <laughs> um. Yeah, I mean, the main, the main issue there for me is I feel like I play too many control decks to just start listing them all, but uh, if we... We think can limit like two each or something. Okay, sure, if we, yeah. If, if, we, if we want to do that. Yeah, you know what? That seems like a fun way to end the podcast. Uh, sure. So yeah, why don't you start us? Okay, so I've, I'll start with the one I'm retiring with Jeskai Control, which most of the stuff I've talked on already, but the, the main draw of Jeskai Control is everything you play is so tempo efficient that you can keep up with the aggro decks and the burn decks and hopefully get under other greedy decks fast enough that you can counter all their value cards and remain at parity. Its weakness is it has a pretty shitty late game. Like, I'll be honest with that. Its late game is garbage because it's only real forms of card, quote-unquote, advantage is, like, cards that are worth slightly more than one card. Like, Replicator Mage gives you a 2-2 and kills an attacker. Rogar's Frenzy is a kill spell and gives you some tokens. All of your card advantage is incidental, so when it comes to true late games, the deck just falls apart. Are we going in a circle? Should I do two right off the bat? Um, Go ahead and just do both of yours. Yeah, just do both of yours uh, off the bat. Okay. So so, so, then the one I'm switching to, well, I'm playing switch to, which is Bant Weaving. This one's the weakness is the, it's basically strength weakness is almost the exact opposite of Jeskai. Weaving has, it has a passable early game, but it's not great. And its mid game is uh, very bad because that's, it has to dedicate the entire mid game to setting up for its full on prison lockdown late game. But the strength of it is against most decks, if it can get to six mana ish while being stabilized, there are a lot of decks that just, flat out can't lose to as it begins looping serene prayer or whatever or guiding light to lock out creatures or burn spells and slowly just goes for its intrepid or iacan win cons utterly unkillable the whole while but that mid game is a rough patch to fight through hey what are your current control projects yeah so um you my best success has come with esper flash which is counter spells and pith wilt and then whatever the best raw engines and wing cons are for that month um and that's just it, it's, a, it's a deck that if it gets to turn three and it isn't under immense pressure it'll generally win the game because it'll have the draw to go long it'll have the interaction to beat whatever someone's trying to do turn four and onwards um, the win conditions that I played were also value engines. There, it, it was it was a really sticky deck, so it was hard to answer its win cons in an efficient way. You know, it got to play Children of the Clouds, it got to play Naraba, it really got to kind of do everything. Um, and that was mostly because Endless Discovery was so good early in the game, and because I drew one turn one every single game that tournament, which didn't uh, hurt, but. <laughs> It was. It, it's a deck that has a lot of axes on which it gets to interact and really only loses when it's pressured early. Um, there, there were some games where I had to sweat a little bit because you know someone was trying to go greedy over me, but I was able to go greedy back over them, uh, which is a really fun way to end a control game. The, the other style of control that I tend to build is combo control which is pretty much in, in, in the lines of counter everything until you combo off. 
or use a bunch of discard spells to strip their hands so that they can't interact with your combo. Um, my two projects related to that are the Hydra deck that I inexplicably won. Uh, was it GPG? H? GPH with. Um, that the goal was to have some mana dorks and then get a thriving Hydra into play and buff all your mana dorks and then attack with the Hydra. And you would attack for, you know, 36 damage or whatever, depends on how many mana dorks you had. And that deck was only good because it was in a cursory glance favored meta. And I was able to bring a bunch of control magic and, well, counter spells, not actual control magic to prevent my opponent from doing the things that would stop my combo from assembling. Um, and the ninjas deck that Clipster is playing in this grand Prix is one that I brought to a league that does a similar thing where you have a couple of counter spells, but mostly discard and a lot of redundancy so that you can strip your opponent's resources and then control how the game runs until you can assemble a combo with predicted Panya and one of the ninjas that lets you recur it infinitely. Those are my styles of control decks, where it's either long game greed or a quick combo kill that you can protect with control until you get there. Yeah. Um, so the kind of two control decks that I've been working on recently are um, a couple different flavors of what I've been calling heart attack control, which is a deck that leverages up Heart of Zendina um, as a large mana engine. Uh, to kill in the late game with Mastery of the Veil. Um, since the realization I basically had was if you're trying to figure out different ways of going over the top and also people are really favoring Cursory Glance, uh, a very good way of killing people is by saying, I've generated 12 mana, here's my 12 mana spell, you die if it resolves. Not even like this, like, oh, well, I can swing for lethal if it resolves, but no, straight up, you lose 20 life if this resolves. Um, and that deck has been treating me fairly well. I had a good run with the bug version in League, and I've been playing the Abzan version in this GP. Um, and it's been, it's been a really good run. Um, but it's also made me kind of acutely aware of some of the issues that it has in terms of, uh, clunkiness or in terms of just the fact that it it feels like it's taxed in terms of a lot of its slots. So once you've said, okay, well, I need to run three to four copies of Intrepid, and I need to run these, you know, two X copies of Master of the Veil, and then I need some other wing cons, so I'll throw in some rock rolls. And you very quickly run out of sl uh, flex slots, um, which feels really rough. And then another deck that I haven't completed a league yet uh, with, which makes it really hard for me to call it... Um, you know, one of my decks, uh, is Esper Dream Sight, um, which was my rebuild of the deck after I declared that the bug version was dead and unplayable, um, <laughs> which may have been un incorrect, but, you know, that's beside the point, um, where the main innovation I had with that deck was the reason why bug Dream Sight felt worse is because a lot of the supporting cast that allowed you to really abuse Dream Sight, um, I, uh, Deadly Manipulations and uh, Grave Tutor, things that help, and uh, Cane Dancer, things that really helped you consistently find uh, Dream Sight well and abuse it. Even, you know, one of those cards was banned, um, the other two were nerfed, and the ways in which they were nerfed hurt their non Dream Sight use, which meant that the deck was even more reliant on finding a Dream Sight well, which it didn't really feel like that before. Um, so that really bothered me intensely because one of the reasons I liked Dream Sight was despite the fact it was 140 cards, I swore it was one of the most consistent decks in the format because of how many different tutors it had and how powerful each of the individual cards was. So the rebuild to Esper was in order to add a bunch of the best uh, other sources of card advantage in the format. So it runs a playset of Gorbez Index, it runs uh, two copies of Remember for Centuries and Worlds Away in order to just get some dumb value looping going. Um, it has uh, four copies of Endless Discoveries back when that card was still really dumb. So mm -hmm. the deck has a much higher density of action in it, as well as a bunch of really good one mana uh, removal. Um, and then the last deck that I've been kind of 
tinkering with in my spare time but I haven't found a build of it that I'm satisfied with is also a combo control deck. Um, or more accurately, it's two different types of combo control decks. Uh, the uniting factor is abusing the two new polymorphs that added were added to the format um, as of this last patch. Mm-hmm. So Space Oddity uh, relies on being able to turn any given one of the deck's uh, creature tokens that it, or creatures that it can generate via animating Intrepid or a creature land or uh, a Planeswalker or Rogar's Frenzy and flipping over the deck until it finds a um, Desert Worms or a Progenitor, depending on what I feel like, um, and then kills your opponent from that board state. Uh, that that's one that I've played a little bit, a Jund variation. The other one that's largely remained theoretical is a Anamorph uh, control deck, um, which uses... So Space Omni specifically turns one of your creatures into a creature, um, which allows you to say, cool, I'm going to have a bunch of things that aren't typed creature but produce creatures. Yeah. Anamorph is different. It turns any... Uh, creature or planeswalker into any non-land permanent. Which means you can cheat out a different suite of things with it. So if you run um, a couple copies of um, the ridiculous enchantment from Discoveries of Akiva, Unified Theory, yeah, and you have some instants or sorceries that allow you to create creature tokens, you can cheat out a unified theory on end step and then just bury people in card advantage and kill via looping a Rogar's Frenzy or something like that. Uh, Because it turns out that when you have access to Ancestral Recall on tap and all of your instant sorceries have dredge zero, it's not that hard (laughs) to piece together a win condition from there. Um, Shocking, isn't it? (laughs) The main issue I was having with that deck is it turns out saying you're not allowed to run any artifacts, enchantments, or planeswalkers is a really big ask when it comes to how on earth are you making the tokens in the first place on cards that are constructed playable. Um, So I haven't found a version of that deck that I'm fully satisfied with yet, Um, but that is something that I've been toying around with. I guess this is a quick note. Do you have any tools to keep yourself from from just drawing what you're trying to what you're trying to cheat out with that last one? So with the Jund version, I ran uh, a couple copies of the um, Glacia card that allows you to shuffle a card from your hand into your library. Um, okay. With this one, uh, with the uh, Unified Theory one, no. Um, you're banking on the fact that you run two copies of Unified Theory and four copies of Animorph, and you're looking at the numbers there and saying, on paper, this should be fine. Um, on paper. <laughs> one of the reasons I abandoned the deck was I also realized, well, I'm dragging the game really late anyway, and I have Vibrant Raptures. You know, there's a chance I'll, have, I'll be able to hardcast a Unified Theory in a game. And I stopped myself as like, look, if your control deck's game plan involves hardcasting Unified Theory at some point... <laughs> you need to retire that control deck in favor of figuring out something else that works. Um, yeah. But I really do want to use Unified Theory as a control finisher because I I love the gameplay of being a control deck with unlimited Ancestral Recalls. Um, that <laughs> speaks to me. All right. Well, that's all. Do the we have anything else to add? Yeah. yeah. So do either of you guys have anything else? I think that's. No, I think I'm good. Mm-hmm. Play control, get good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's the official <laughs> stance of this podcast. <laughs> All right, everyone, uh, thank you for tuning in to the other modern, and hopefully, we'll have more episodes of this um, uh, to get to you soon.